Pat Project family, how's it going? Now, we talk about meat a lot on this podcast, which is why we've partnered with Piedmontese and have for years now, because they have some of the best beef on the planet. All right, Piedmontese beef has cuts that are fattier in terms of their ribeyes, and they have also cuts that are leaner in terms of their flat irons, but you can get cuts for no matter what diet you're on. Andrew, how can they get their hands on it? Yeah, head over to Piedmontese.com. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E.com. Check out, enter promo code POWER for 25% off your entire order. And if your order is $150 or more, you get free two-day shipping. Mm. <laughs> Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Oh, dude, the internet was different. <laughs> the internet was so fun. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. You know, we would all like just like, just play this shit and laugh as middle schoolers and high schoolers. It was the, it was the greatest thing. But now this would be very, you cannot very, you can't anymore, laugh at this bro. anymore. Fuck off. God damn it. Okay. <sighs> Let me send this email out and you guys can chat about today's guest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you rolling? We're rolling. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Today's guest is a kind of denier of a lot of, Things that I guess we have accepted to be like words, terms, um, things that we can communicate about to in the fitness community to oftentimes, I guess, just help people lose weight. Yeah. So uh, Bart K, his name is, and he talks about um, how calories are just heat and they don't really represent much. And I mean, I don't want to jumble up what he says. We'll, we'll get to it when he's on the show. Uh, but he seems to be caught up in like the semantics of um, people utilizing calories to lose weight, people utilizing uh, cardio type training to lose weight. He's not a fan of any of these things. We've kind of seen people come around before that have just that talked about these things, but um, he seems to really like adamantly deny <laughs> Uh, that it he it, seem, it's, it appears that he doesn't think that it has any value, mm. and uh, that's interesting take on it. While I myself am not a calorie counter, uh, I never really got way into it. I can admit that it seems to be an effective way to regulate, moderate, re, uh, to uh, manage your body weight yeah. is to see how many calories you got in, and maybe some sort of estimate of. I guess what you're blowing out, but he's just kind of keeps saying like calories are just heat calories, are just heat. And I don't know exactly what he means. So it'd be good to try to, um, I would like to try to learn more about what he's trying to say. And I'm interested to see, is he kind of on a mission to try to help anybody or is he just trying to like, uh, cut people down because he's got different knowledge than they do. Yeah. Paying attention to his content has been pretty interesting because your brother brought him up a few weeks ago, and then I, so I started going down his content rabbit hole. Um, I, I'm just going to start with saying I just want to understand uh, his his practical aspects of helping people to lose body fat, right? So, so because you know I'm not going to get too much into it, but I just I want to understand. Mm -hmm. So let's let him in. Let's see what happens here. Mm-hmm. Bart. Oh, we're in the a matrix, matrix. The pink yeah. matrix. Oh, my God. That's cool. He's surrounded by calories. The meat militia. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know if we uh, can hear I, him. I got him now. Sorry, that was on me. I'll take that. Oh, yeah. Loss. Can we hear him now? Yep, we got him. Right. Just yeah, there we go. How's that? Perfect. Great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me. All right, let's just dive right in. Uh, what does it mean... You kind of, you'll say oftentimes that calories are just heat. Um, yeah. And it seems like you're not a big fan of even people utilizing calories uh, to lose weight. I'd like to learn more about some of your thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay. So the statement calories are heat is a parsimonious throw out hook line. It is designed with Melissa forethought to get people thinking and to cause people to react emotionally to what they've heard. It's for clicks, it's for views, and it works its backside <laughs> off. It works really well. Okay. The full disclosure statement is that a calorie is a measurement of heat energy. 
it is specifically a measurement of heat energy. It is explicitly measured as heat. It is a form of energy. Energy is a construct, and it's a construct because it has no externally verifiable definition. Energy is defined by the clever physicists as that which gives impetus to work, basically. And it comes in lots of different forms. It comes in the form of heat, which is thought of as the lowest form of energy. It comes in the form of kinetic energy, the movement of particles, if you like. It comes as chemical energy stored in the bonds of food substances, for example. Um, and we could go on all day talking about different forms of energy. I think these are things that most people have some kind of a handle on. And the problem with using the calorie as a tool, as a guide to how much energy you actually are consuming in effect in the real world, is that it is vastly, grossly, hugely inaccurate to do so. The human body is not remotely similar to a bomb calorimeter. The human body is an open thermodynamic system which exchanges both energy and mass across its borders. Can I butt in for just a second here? Please, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Do you think other people would agree with that statement that um – calories are are inaccurate like i think um because we got like fiber and we got like protein and we have things digest differently we also can mm. recognize that we're all different so we're yep. maybe gonna intake uptake the food regulate the food differently than each person so you think yep. most people would agree with that or, they, or is there Look, did, did, any, anyone that understands the physics underpinning any of this at all will have no choice but to accept what i have just said as absolutely correct the calorie is an estimation of actual physical real world energy derived from food by a human body, any given human body on any given day under any given set of circumstances, hugely inaccurate, wildly inaccurate. Ergo, if you want to use calories in calories out as a tool to predictably change your body composition, then what you are required to do is vastly, grossly undereat in order to make sure that the actual effective change in your effective energy intake is outside the range of that noise around the signal so that you definitely are, in effect, in an energy deficit situation. Vastly, grossly undereating for any reasonable period of time is utterly contraindicated. It's bad for metabolism. It's bad for your long-term health. It's bad psychologically. It's just bad in every way. And people running around ignorantly saying calories in, calories out always works. What they are doing is missing the entire point. They're missing all the nuance there. And then what they'll do when I make a video critiquing them on their calories in, calories out assertion is they'll take my video, creatively edit it, cut it down, take out bits of it out of context and make it look like I'm some buffoon saying something I haven't said. Basically, that's the technique. And then they send all their 12-year-old prepubescent supporters to my channel to bomb that as if that's going to change my life in any way. It's not. Keep doing it, boys, because actually what you're doing is helping the algorithm. You're helping my channel grow and you're helping push it out to an ever wider audience by swarming all over my channel saying stupid, stupid things, which, I mean, the comments I'm getting on my channel from these idiots show absolutely without question that these idiots have not watched my video at all. They've watched somebody else's video, which suggests that I said something completely different to what I actually did say. But anyway, keep doing it, boys. It's helpful. So, Bart, I, I'm curious about this because I'll, I can agree, calories are inaccurate. Um, yep. When you're tracking certain things on a day-to-day -day basis, the measurements are not, first off, the measurements are not always the same. You put it into mm -hmm. whatever your favorite macro tracking app is, it's mm -hmm. going to be off. I yep. totally understand that. Um, yep. But there's a population and... When we look at bodybuilders and physique athletes, let's actually not even pay attention to the 
NPC side of things where there's drug use. Mm-hmm. Let's think about yeah. the natural bodybuilders who, and their bikini athletes, whatever, where they yeah. only have inputs of food um, and whatever, and then outputs of movement, exercise, whatever else. Yes. Yeah. And this population, because some of their habits are so in check, and this is not indicative of like the general population, right? These people are living very structured lives yes, and they, they're extremely structured. Everything that goes in and out is structure. But this population will use calories and say, within a 16-week period, I am going to go from this weight to this weight. And they can do that without fail while shedding body fat and minimal muscle, right? So they're not just losing weight. They are losing body fat, but they're using calories to do it. So I get the calories are inaccurate. I totally understand that. But they are working off averages, and by working off and changing their calories over time, they're able to get from point A to point B purely yep. by tracking those. And the the only other thing I want to add on to that is, uh, I many people, if they do the, they choose to track their calories. Some people do choose to vastly undereat, and that's not good in the long term. That's why they yo-yo diet. They lose weight and then they gain all that weight back and more. But you don't have it's to vastly. Do, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's one of the things that happen, but. You also don't have to vastly undereat to be able to achieve that fat loss. That really, so, really yeah. depends on how accurate. Number one, you are able to gauge and track what you genuinely are eating and how honest mm-hmm. you are, even with yourself, on that. Yeah. Number two, it depends on the accuracy of the reported so-called calories contained in foods on the nutrition labels, which are allowed by law to be in error by up to 20%. Oh, I understand that. Huge error. Huge error. Yeah. Um, Athletes who are at one end of the bell-shaped curve who have very, very, very structured lives and who live for this, this is their job or their occupation or their pseudo-job or pseudo-occupation as the case may be, some of these people can show good success case by case. You say without fail, I would disagree with that. A lot of people do fail to get the body composition changes they were looking for by tracking or attempting to track calories because partly accurately tracking energy by the use of the calorie in is problematic, if not impossible, to get anywhere near accurate for most people. So is energy expenditure. That's just as complex, just as difficult to measure. And as such, you've got an error on the inside of that equation that people are going to be subject to and an error on the outside of that equation as well. Yeah. Such that my statement earlier for the average Joe, for the average person who is not a professional bodybuilder or, or a professional or, or sub-professional athlete of that sort, they will have to reduce their effective intake of energy more than that which is sensible in order to be sure that they will get the body composition change that they're looking for in the time frame that they're looking for it. Now, you may disagree with me on that. You may say it works every time, all the time without fail. And I would just have to say, well, I disagree. Well, okay. I have seen so many people fail attempting that methodology Mm-hmm. Um, when we can show another methodology which requires the person to count absolutely nothing, track absolutely nothing whatsoever, use purely physiological satiety signaling, which does work. Mm-hmm. And it works because it works on the thing that actually really does have the most influence over someone's body composition, that being their hormonal and endocrine responses to a species-appropriate, species-specific diet. So there's a few things. And I mean, yeah, I know a lot of threads. Yeah. yeah. Of course, many people fail. (laughs) Like many people fail at doing a lot of different diets. There are people. Well, that's different from what you said before because you said without fail, this works. No. What I said is that within this population of people, there are people who say, I will get to this weight to this weight in a certain amount of weeks. And they do it without fail. I said, those people do it without fail. Okay. I don't say that they all do it. Those people at the very, very far end of a bell shaped curve. But I also want to say. They are the exception and not the rule. Understood. But there are also people who do work normal jobs, who choose to compete, who track their calories, and sure. they live normal lives. I know many and of results those. results vary wildly, don't they? Uh, 
Well, I mean, results vary wildly with anything yeah. you choose to do because of the individual that's choosing to do it. I make and a choice. That is my to, argument. But, that is my argument right there. But I mean, also Bart, we don't track our calories. I'm not over here saying that you must track your calories. I haven't tracked my calories since 2017 and have maintained right. a great body composition with habits, as you talked about. Like we maintain right. certain habits that allow us to eat to society, right? That allow us to have certain things within our day. We, we don't track right? We right. eat real food. So right. no, I'm not saying that people can do this without fail. There's nothing that people can do without, you know, your choices. Okay, so we're you in make agreement. Them. Yeah. This but is, but yeah. what I'm trying to get at here is I don't know how we can say that the calories and calories, like, are we talking about the semantics of calories and calories out or that it's purely wrong? Because if it was wrong, and the only reason why I'm referencing this population Okay, these population mm -hmm. of athletes that track their calories, track their intake and everything is because mm -hmm. this is a population that is going off of the thing that you say is wrong and they're achieving mm -hmm. those results uh, fairly, uh, extremely accurately. Some do fail, yes, okay. but the, the ones that track and they pay attention to the way their weight varies because it goes up and down, it doesn't just go straight down. They pay attention mm -hmm. to those things. They can get from point A to point B yep. by tracking okay. calories. Fine. And we're, I just wonder- there's, there's, no, there's no disagreement here in terms of there are some people who do get the result thereafter. They are the extreme end of a bell-shaped curve. They are an exception to the rule. They are not the rule. You also need to be very clear if you're going to be honest with your viewers mm -hmm. about what it is I have said about calories in, calories out. And what I have said is, that as a tool for yeah. Joe Public to use in order to predictably achieve a given output in a given amount of time, it is not going to work for most people. And At by work, what do you mean? Remotely as well as they want it to. Okay. It okay. is a mistake to do that because what people will find themselves doing is they'll, they'll place themselves at a certain so-called caloric deficit at the outset mm -hmm. They will see that it's not working as they track themselves along and they will steadily increase that caloric deficit because I'm just not calories in, calories out hard enough. I know how to do it even harder. And they will end up vastly, grossly, hugely under eating for a significant number of months often at a time. And in so doing, they will destroy their metabolism. They will undercut their health and they will actually reduce their odds in future of actually ever achieving the goal they're looking to achieve. It's stupid, dumb, contraindicated advice to say calories in, calories out always works. It's it's the law of the universe and you too are subject to that because that's just false. It's rubbish. How does somebody lose weight? Uh, how does somebody lose weight when they're not in a caloric deficit? I believe this is something that you've said, but I could yeah, be uh, I not have accurate. Done. Yeah, what you need to understand, Mark, is that words are important. A spade is a spade and semantics do play a role here. Now, weight is a force exerted on your mass, however that mass is made up by gravity. In effect, gravity is not actually a force, but let's not go there. Your weight is a vector of gravity pulling your mass down towards the center of mass of the earth, basically. Your weight is made up in a lot of different components, the largest of which is water. For someone like myself with my body composition, my water composition is around about 63 to 65% of my mass. Okay. One of the things that causes a person to maintain a lot of water in their body or on their body is inflammation. If you consume a diet that's anti-inflammatory, your body will toss that water off and you will lose weight on a scale. Now, I did... A two-week period between the first of January and the sorry, the first of January and the fourteenth or fifteenth, whatever it was, two around two weeks, fifteen days, something like that. At the beginning of this year, where I was tracking the so-called calories in the food I was eating purely out of interest, it wasn't the point of the thing. The point of the thing was I was doing a thing called priming, which is a program of vastly, grossly overeating for two weeks solid prior to a period of body recomp and, and cutting and stuff after that. 
which then goes on for 90 days following that. What it does is it sets you up psychologically to be able to do some fasting. It makes sure that your body is replete with all the nutrient that you require on board so that you're not going to get short of anything while you're doing the fasting. And it's actually also a little bit diversionary because when you're eating that much food for two weeks solid, you honestly feel at the time, or I felt at the time, I'll speak for myself, I felt like if I never see another steak in my life, that'll be fine. Or any food of any kind. I was just so pumped. <laughs> now, for those that want some kind of context here, I am 50 years of age, 5'0". I'm 5'6", and 135 pounds dripping wet. <laughs> now, I was consuming six to six and a half thousand so-called calories in the form of steak, associated fat with that steak, and additional fat in the form of butter and a yogurt-based satsiki preparation, pretty much. Three full meals a day plus snacks, Pog, pog, pog myself to absolutely rifting for 14 days solid. Here is what happened. I lost 15 pounds. 12 and a half of which, give or take, was water. The rest of it was actually fat. So there is no way you could say I was in a caloric deficit that would suggest that there was any reason I should have lost two and a half pounds of fat during that two weeks. Was there Nonetheless, anything, that is what occurred. Was there anything previously that you were doing that may have led to some of the results too? Like maybe you were eating a lot of carbohydrate and then you dropped them out or something like that? I was eating a very small amount of carbohydrate because I've been a very low carbohydrate follower for about 27 years. I'll tell you exactly what I was consuming that was carbohydrate based or at least some carbohydrate based. I was having a packet of corn chips, maybe once a week, the occasional piece of pizza, that nasty supermarket pizza that comes in a plastic wrap that you put in the oven for 12 yeah. minutes, that kind of junk, oh, <laughs> God, vile. And I was drinking probably 12 units of alcohol a week in the form of cider, a low carbohydrate cider, but not a zero carbohydrate cider. So all of that stuff was dropped out. However, None of that, all of that, added up to anything remotely similar to 6,000 calories a day or 6,500. So what I did in effect was increase my caloric intake three, three and a half times over in that two weeks, during which time I lost roughly two and a half pounds of fat off my body and about 12 and a half pounds of water. So calories in, calories out is busted. There are other things at play, endocrine responses, hormonal responses, inflammatory responses. Mm -hmm. These things are important. They are not included in the calories in, calories out uh, equation. Ergo, the calories in, calories out equation is incomplete. It's reductionist and it is an error. Let me Sorry see if I can, that. let me see if I can tackle some of this a little bit. So yeah. Maybe some of your assertion is uh, something along these lines, like, um, and, and I know that this has been uh, also something that's been put forward uh, due, due to like marketing, um, these uh, like net carbohydrates. Do you kind of think that uh, there's, a lot of there's a lot of calories that may be like net calories, therefore mm -hmm. we have like a lot of inaccurate measures uh, mm -hmm. you did state that, um, you do believe there is a way to, sounds like you stated there's a way to overeat and there's a way yep. to under eat yep. energy, correct? Mm -hmm. Like we're right yep. with that. Um, yep. but calories as we know them, um, should be looked at harder. If they should be looked at harder, what should we look at and what should be a measure so we can help people yep. to like lose weight basically? Yeah. Okay. So the, the Body difficulty fat. is, I, I, I get where you're going there, and and it's a perfectly sensible, perfectly sane question. It makes perfect sense to ask that question. Okay. Well, if calories are no good as a measurement of effective energy in food, what's a better one? Would be the question. Okay. The answer is the reason that calories are universally accepted and universally used ubiquitously as a 
relatively reasonable estimation of effective actual energy contained in foods is because better methodologies to actually measure this energy are vastly complex, hugely expensive kit is required, and probably multiple PhDs to run that kit to make anything like an actually accurate measurement. And so the scientific community and the community at large go, meh, <laughs> it'll do. My argument is it will not do for most people precisely because it is vastly inaccurate and because calories in, calories out does not consider your response. Hormonally, endocrine system, inflammation system, all of that kind of stuff, which does play a massive role in your body composition and ergo your weight. So then I'm left often with people saying, okay, fine, there is no better measurement, so that's the best one we've got, so why don't we just go with that? And I say, well, look, people can and do. There are millions and millions of people who support YouTube creators and influencers and people of that ilk who want to get up in front of people on their hind legs and say calories in, calories out is great, it always works, and you should use it too. I am always going to disagree with those people because I genuinely know absolutely, based on the science and the physics and everything underpinning it, that those people are in error for most people. They are sending most people up the garden path and they are giving those people advice that will, in my opinion, almost certainly lead to a reduction in their life quality, if not their life quantity as well, frankly. I think it's dangerous, contraindicated and irresponsible advice and, and it should stop. But that's my opinion on it based on my understanding of the science. Um, that said, the, the ray of light at the end of the tunnel, which is not an oncoming train, by the way, it's actually good news, is if you eat a species-appropriate, species-specific diet for a human being, you never have to count a single anything or track a single anything. You will naturally, easily obtain and maintain the ideal physique for you without any effort whatsoever. How do you so get people to, answer to the problem? To yeah. The boundary. Right. I think we're pretty aware of that. Like if you eat a carnivorous diet or you eat things that are natural from the earth, whatever mm -hmm. you deem those things to be, I guess we could get into arguments about what's natural and what's not natural. But for the most part, if you eat meat, fruit, vegetables, you're probably pretty good to go. And it would you be said I'd lose the fruit and vegetables. What's that? I would lose the fruit and vegetables, not natural. Right. Right. And you, like I said, you could kind of argue about this or that, mm. but either yeah. way, uh, it would be difficult to gain weight, and especially with meat, a uh, carnivore diet only well, uh, gets to be really difficult. Six and a half thousand calories for two weeks, two and a half pounds of fat off my body and right. 12 and a half pounds of water. Right. That's a now, very short would term. Would that have though. continued? Would that trend have continued if I continue to stuff that much food into my body for longer? You would be 95 weeks? pounds right now. <laughs> well, exactly. I may have faded it away entirely. <laughs> yeah. I'm not suggesting that that's what you should do long term. I'm I'm reporting that is what occurred. Whether people that support Greg do set or not, like it or not, that is what occurred. You know, it's documented in videos. If people want to watch them, I stood on the scales at the beginning of the year. I weighed X amount of pounds. Two weeks later, having stuffed myself with six and a half, six to six and a half thousand calories a day every day for 14, 15 days, and I was 15 pounds lighter. Suck it up. That's what happened. You know, Bart, I know you're not, I know you don't like Greg Doucette and you also. That's nothing personal. I've never met nothing. Greg. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or I guess the information. Don't like the information. Yeah, I don't he puts like what he says. What he says. Yeah. The information yeah. put forward about calories in, calories out. But, yeah. you know, when, when responsible individuals that are choosing to use this model generally talk mm -hmm. about it, it's not just calories in, calories out. You remember, I don't know, back in like 2013, 14, social media, IIFYM, mm -hmm. people started yeah. tracking Pop-Tarts and Doritos yeah. and making this yeah. fit into their calories. And as long as they are in yeah. deficit, they were losing weight. And some people yeah. were, yeah, people were losing weight, but at the same time, they weren't feeling full. They would have binge eating cycles, potentially. Some people who were mm -hmm. super rigid maybe made that work. Um, I did that type of thing for a bit when I was okay. first learning about it. And I was like, Ooh yeah, I can eat pop tarts and pizza and shit and I can drop fat or whatever. Yeah. But 
over time, people continue to learn that, hey, if food choices matter. These foods will not help you feel satiated. Even if you're in a caloric deficit or even if you're in a surplus, these foods will drive you to want to eat more. So yeah. responsible individuals that are talking and utilizing this model generally aren't saying it's just about that. Generally, they're trying to help lead people towards foods that lead to satiation. Extra protein. Yeah. Some people are in favor of utilizing vegetables and the fiber in vegetables to help people feel full. I know, again, mm -hmm. they're not natural, not species appropriate, but they, they, they lead people down there to understand, hey, your food choices matter. And if yeah. you are choosing to be in a deficit, choose foods that are going to help you feel full so that you can do this for a long period of time. Because if you eat too many processed foods, well, you're not going to be in that deficit for long and it's not going to last a long time. So what I'm wondering is utilizing that model in a responsible approach is something yeah. that can help people and can lead them in the right direction. It's not just calories in, calories out. The choices you make with your foods matter along, obviously, with the choices you have for your lifestyle. And so, it does make yeah. me wonder, is this really as dangerous as you're saying it is if it is communicated responsibly? Okay. All right. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, I think. And my response is that in my professional opinion, as someone who really does know this area very, very well and who does understand the science, the physiology, the nutritional requirements for human beings and such really well, the vast majority of commentators on human nutrition in the health and fitness space on the YouTubes, for example, the vast majority of those individuals are anything but responsible. They are incompetent, Dunning-Kruger sufferers of the highest order. They are people who are so destitute of competence in the area that they are talking publicly about that they are not even capable of grasping the depth of their own incompetence. They are people who will open their mouth in order to get clicks or views or advertising revenue or affiliate funds, however their, whatever their business model is or any combination of those things, most of these people, the last thing that actually concerns them genuinely at the end of the day is the health and well-being of anyone that watches their material at all, in fact. How are they, they getting good – how are they getting good comments and like people are like, hey, I lost 100 pounds, you changed my life, things like that? People – are going to make positive and not so positive comments on pretty much anything. And it's up to the individual channel owners, I guess, or channel managers to decide what remains, whether they're going to delete any comments, whether they're going to leave all the comments there, which ones they're going to put forward by pinning them or which ones they're not, who they're going to block permanently because they're people who are making comments that are basically unacceptable at all, not necessarily to the to the person who's being commented against, but against things like the YouTube algorithm, you know, vastly, grossly, hugely insulting stuff that you can't put in writing on YouTube, which seems strange because you actually can you can put it in in words, like people will notice in my videos that I tend to curse people out. I tend to be very abrasive. I tend to be very, very confrontational. It's like I'm absolutely going out of my way to try and offend everybody. Well done for spotting that. That's exactly what I'm doing. Why am I doing that? Because it works. It gets clicks. It does, mm -hmm. yeah. It means that people are responding emotionally, either positively or negatively. I don't really have too many people down the middle that say, yeah, your channel's okay. I have people that say, you're great. We love you. We love what you do. You make us laugh. You educate us by subterfuge. It's valuable stuff. We enjoy the characters you play. We enjoy the comedy. And there are other people that absolutely hate it. And that's fine with me because the thing that the YouTube's algorithm picks up on is whether somebody engages with material and responds to it emotionally by hitting like or unlike. People, what people don't understand is if someone hits unlike on your video, that's not negative. <laughs> that's, still good. A, that's an emotional response that YouTube sees as a positive thing, mm. and they will push your video out to an ever larger audience still in the hope that you manage to offend some more people. <laughs> uh, what if uh... and they can make more advertising revenue out of that?
What if the thing that is suggested by somebody leads someone to eat a larger percentage of meat? You yourself yeah. mentioned you eat uh, occasionally will have some different food. And so maybe your percentage yeah. is higher than most. But um, yeah. what if a Greg Doucette or Elaine Norton or some of these guys, Thomas DeLauer, ourselves, yeah. whoever, lead mm-hmm. somebody to go from having a diet that has meat in it once a day to then yeah. they're having meat four or five times a day and they're making a lot of progress. Okay, that, that's a great thing. So if you make one video on your channel, Mark, this week that that leads people to become more reliant on meat and associated fat and less reliant on plant material in their diet, I would congratulate you for that and say you've done a great job, dear. that's a great thing for those people that you've influenced in that way. But that's what because- people are doing when you're when you – undertake a bodybuilding style diet that's what happens well yes i I think you'll find i mean i I don't think there's anyone that would disagree that bodybuilders tend to eat more meat however bodybuilders also tend to eat way too much carbohydrate vastly too much carbohydrate and they'll listen too much carbohydrate for what for health long term and for metabolic for lack of metabolic consequences later in life and and inflammatory process that will be a problem, heart disease, all those kind of things. I mean, those are things that we can get into, um, you know, at some point if you want to talk about the particular makeup of the diet macronutrient-wise. Absolutely. But to, to conclude the point I was making, if you made a video that encourages people to eat more meat and less plant material, that's great. If that same week you make a video that says calories in, calories out is a good tool, you too can use it and you should use it, that's all there is. Just just count your calories in and count some kind of estimate of your calories out and make sure that your calories in is lower than your calories out, then I would not congratulate you on that video. I would say that's ridiculous. I don't know if that many people are really saying that. Yeah. Well, directly calories in, calories out, the only thing that matters. By omission of a clear, absolutely clear and explicit statement to the contrary saying, here is what the optimal diet for a human being is. Here is what the nutritional requirements for a human being is. This is the way you should eat as a human being. If you don't clarify that, then by omission of a statement to the contrary, if you get up on your hind legs and say calories in, calories out is brilliant, it always works, and you two should use it, then you haven't done the job. You've done half the job. How have you found you misled people? Hmm? How have you been able to find the uh optimal human diet and is it a carnivorous style diet i believe it is a carnivorous diet as close to 100 percent as the person concerned can possibly muster and maintain in their lifestyle given that human beings are just that they're human beings and there are stresses on them and humans do live in an environment that's not the natural environment that they lived in as we evolved sure all understood The difficulty with this is you can't go to this body of evidence called nutrition science, human nutrition science. And the reason you can't go to that body of evidence is because it does not exist. There are mechanistic speculation studies of a short term under poor control. There are no long term hard health outcome experimental intervention studies in human beings over multiple decades kept under lock and key under proper observation in a laboratory setting to determine cause and effect. As such, we have an ideology, which is a prevalent ideology around human nutrition. And that prevalent ideology is based on consensus and not science, and it is bought and paid for. That's where the problem is. So to find what is actually likely, according to actual hard science, to be ideal for humans, health span wise, lifespan wise, all that kind of stuff. You actually have to go to a number of areas of science outside the so-called nutrition science fraternity. You need to go to comparative anatomy and physiology of human organ systems. Um, You need to go to studies of the metabolic pathways You need to go to anthropological evidences such as stable isotope testing from the collagen of long bones of skeletal remains of humans. When you do that and you look through all of that material, the result is pretty unequivocal. Also, you need to apply the lens of Darwinian evolution as a fact, an absolute irrefutable fact, 
Um, now, that does not preclude um, an original creation by some higher power or being or God, if you want to believe in that. I'm not saying that's wrong, but since that time, which is clearly a lot longer ago than what, for example, the Bible will tell us, there are processes going on in the human body, in the human genome. We are subject to natural selection pressures in the same way any other animal is or any other bacteria even or virus or anything. Not that a virus is a living thing, but that's for another day. <laughs> so those are the things you look at and all of those things point in the same direction. All of those things tell us that human beings are absolutely obligate hyper carnivores. I, I kind of agree in some sense that I, I'm not a huge fan of trying to science the human body as it relates to really anything. I don't like it mm. in lifting. Mm. I don't like it in nutrition necessarily, although it does have does seem to have some utility. And from an observational standpoint, it seems like you can it seems like we can get closer to the truth sometimes on some stuff. Like for example, mm. people that are people that are able to reach uh, old age and be uh, still um, have good vitality mm. are usually smaller people. They usually don't have yep. a lot of body weight on them. Like we can kind of observe that. Uh, oh, I'm doing well then. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm good then. There's probably, account. there's not a lot of people that are, you know, 95 years old that are probably carrying around an extra 60 pounds of body weight sure. and, and things like that. So, but those people, uh, they're not necessarily using a carnivorous diet. So mm. like, I guess so, is, is as long as you don't overeat, that, as long as you don't yeah. over consume energy for like really long periods of time, it seems yeah. like you maybe get a pass to live a long and pretty good life. Yes. Yeah. I, I think there is a value and not, for example, carrying extra body mass, not being for want of a better term, overly adipose, overly fat or obese. Okay, all of those things will definitely lead you to a higher likelihood of an earlier death. I don't think anyone remotely sensible would question that. Um, I think we would all accept that as being a pretty fair statement on fact. If you're over fat, then your likelihood of death for multiple different reasons per year of follow-up is going to be higher. Yes. So you can eat a reasonable diet in terms of the volume of effective actual energy that you're consuming such that you are weight stable and you might live 90, 100 years. Absolutely. When you talk to experts in comparative genetics and comparative anatomy and comparative physiology and you say to those people, take modern lifestyles out of it, take all of this out of it, just looking at the human system as we can understand it, at the molecular level and at the genetic level, if we just got out of our own stupid way, how long should a given living how long should a given living human being live? What is the lifespan of a human as determined by those things? Generally, the answer that comes back is around about 150, actually, for an average human life. That's what it should be if we would just get out of our own way. The only way really to do that is to eat a species-appropriate, species-specific diet predictably. Sure, there'll be outliers. There'll be people that'll last 150 years drinking an eight-ounce bottle of scotch and smoking two packs a day. Absolutely. There'll be someone just to prove that wrong that does that. But on, we're talking about on average here. On average, the only way to achieve this is to eat the way you are designed to eat as a human being. And to exercise appropriately, which means appropriate volume, appropriate intensity, appropriate rest days in between, which is another thing that many lifters get badly wrong. But again, that's also for another day. Um, so I think what you're saying is true. Yes, absolutely. It's better not to be fat. But that doesn't mean that not being fat is optimal. Optimal is following your genetic gift, your evolutionary gift, following the way you are designed as a human being to interact with the world in which you live as closely as possible in modern societies. Because let's face it, we cannot avoid the toxins that we have pumped into our environment. 
entirely. What you got over there, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to remind people watching if they really, really dislike what Bart's saying, go ahead and hit the thumbs down button. And get some <laughs> no, more don't of that. Do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get, yeah, get some of that negative. <laughs> it, it works yeah. out. All publicity is good publicity. But uh, <laughs> That's right. I, I did want to go back to uh, some of the uh, like tracking and the calories in, calories out uh, thing. Uh, in the, in, and I'm sure you've gotten this many times before, but I'm just curious to, to hear it. Uh, especially for our audience. But uh, the example you gave about the person that is going to undertake this style of diet and they vastly under eat. And next yeah. thing you know, they feel like crap. Their energy is probably going to be super low. And then they either yeah. yo-yo diet or they completely get off the diet and they say, it obviously didn't work for me. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, when I see or when I hear about this example, I would see it more as user error, not not the fact that like calories in calories out doesn't work. So again, I'm sure you've heard this many times, but I'm curious to it's hear. It's about nuance, Andrew, isn't it? It's about the nuance. It's yes. about saying to someone, here is all the information you need. Okay. So just getting up and saying calories in, calories out is brilliant and will work. And that's what you should do. We're done here. Thanks very much. Join me next week when we talk about something else. Mm -hmm. That is irresponsible. That is not the information that person needs to responsibly manage their body composition. That is partial information, that is incompetent, that is irresponsible, and that should stop. Okay. I've never said anything different from that. Yeah. And so, okay, then I just want to go back. So um, just real quickly, uh, or I guess maybe it can't be that quick, uh, were you tracking prior to... Uh, the 6,000 calories a day for two weeks. Uh, the reason why I ask because is because uh, to the best of your knowledge, and I have an idea how you were able to understand, but how do you know that you were in fact in a calorie surplus when mm -hmm. you took away a lot of the, like, you know, you said the pizza and then uh, okay. I think you said the right. pints of beer. So number one, the amount, the volume of both food and alcohol put together that I was consuming, if you use 7K calories per gram of alcohol, and if you use 4K calories of energy for carbohydrates, which is not particularly accurate, and if you use 4K calories of energy per gram of protein, which is vastly, hugely, totally inaccurate, then on a back of an envelope calculation, my caloric intake typically fairly stably for the six, 12 months or so prior to that two weeks was without actually tracking it. So this is back of an envelope. Yeah, this is what I'm eating. And I'm being honest with myself. 2,100 to 2,350 give or take per day. Total. The Actual calorie intake during the two weeks was tracked according to the labels, you know, the the chip that the steaks come in and mm -hmm. there's a plastic over that and there's a label on it that says this is what's in it. I was using those figures and cross-checking a bit with weighing it because I know about the 20% error. And the range was 6,000 to 6,500 for that 14, 15 days. I can't remember whether it was 14 or 15 days. That's why I keep saying 14 or 15. doesn't matter. That's not really the point. So, yes, it was a pretty accurate guesstimate of what was really genuinely going on. So, yes, I did increase my effective so called caloric intake by three and a half times over. How did you personally find the carnivore diet? Um, I really enjoy it. It's, it's something that I would adhere to, to the 95% adherence level pretty much all the time, and I have done now for about seven years. The only things that typically remain in my diet now that are not carnivorous is I drink coffee, and I like to have a kind of satsiki style thing with my meat, which is really just unsweetened Greek-style yogurt, which is fine and is carnivorous, but there's a very small amount of very finely chopped garlic in it. So I know I have to hand in my carnivore card and <laughs> report for public naming and shaming. I, I never really was a carnivore and I did it wrong anyway. If you like, fine. And then there's the occasional splurge on some corn chips or potato chips. 
and I might occasionally have maybe five or six units of alcohol after a game of sport on a Saturday. How did you uh, like come across this? The carnivore diet was a natural progression from my sort of 27 year history or so now of, of ketogenic lifestyle. Um, the first time I heard about it was when I saw the classic Jordan Peterson podcast with Joe Rogan. And I went, yeah, that makes sense. I'll check into it because I'm a scientist and I want to make sure that, you know, this is not going to lead me to huge nutrient deficiency. I'm not going to die of scurvy or get bum cancer or something like that. And so I checked into it a little bit and went, yeah, this is fine. I'm going to do that. And I just, I've never looked back. It, it's made a huge, incredible difference to many aspects of my health without any question. And I, I find it's something that's easy to adhere to, to a relatively high percentage level. Um, it's not problematic. It's not a distress or a chore. It's really, it, it's now, it's, it's just a perfectly normal part of my life now. It's just, it's, it's not even a diet. It's a lifestyle. It's how, it's how I do nutrition by eating meat. And when I say meat, I mean muscle meat. I don't eat organs at all. So it's muscle meat, associated fat, and selected dairy products basically is the basis. So for yourself, why is it that um, fruits and vegetables are out of the picture? or okay. And why would you suggest um, that people also get it out of the picture? Right. Okay. So there are two or three reasons, really. The first reason is fiber, dietary fiber, which is absolutely apparently contraindicated in the human diet. It is not helpful. It does not improve bowel function. There is only one even remotely pseudo clinical study on this topic available. And it unequivocally clearly says the more fiber, the more gut dysfunction over a relatively short period. Sure. Um, but it's the, the result is so striking, so clear that it's very difficult to ignore it entirely. I personally seven years or so with basically to all intents and purposes, no fiber in my diet at all. Um, so clearly I haven't been to the bathroom for seven years. Mm -hmm. No, once a day, every day, like clockwork, no stress, no strain, not even cut into stanzas. It's like the machine at McDonald's that does the ice cream. <laughs> We're out of here, done, no problem. Mm -hmm. Perfect function. Yeah. Vastly better than it's been for my entire life because I've had every digestive disorder you could possibly imagine at some point, all miraculously evaporated when I removed all the fiber from my diet. The next person maybe doesn't react to fiber as strongly as I do, mm -hmm. but make no mistake, they will react to some level and it will be a detractor on their health span, probably on their lifespan. It will be one of those things that determines that person does not make it to 150. One of many things probably. So get it gone. You don't need it. It's not required. Um, there is nothing in fiber that you can't live perfectly well and healthily without. It doesn't impact your bowel function negatively. That's fine. The second reason to avoid fruits is they contain a lot of carbohydrates, which are absolutely contraindicated in the diet. Exogenous carbohydrates above the individual tolerance level. The individual tolerance to carbohydrate is just that. It's a little bit individual. It depends on your age, your stage, your body size, your fitness level, your training status, the time of year. All of those things play into it, absolutely, and a bunch of other things as well. But make no mistake, you cross your tolerance level to carbohydrates and there will be a problem with your health in some way. It will probably present itself as weight gain, Fat gain, I should say. Let's call a spade a spade. Fat gain. Inflammatory increase. Electrolyte disturbance. Palpitations. Muscle cramps. Attention deficit problems. Sleeping problems. Those kinds of things. All the things that Paul Saladino suffered. Um, basically. Were, did you have more? I don't want to cut Yeah, there's one off. other. Okay. Many fruits contain seeds, mm. which are perfectly safe if they pass through your alimentary tract unbroken. But if you chew those seeds up or those seeds are broken down and to any degree in your gut, 
those seeds will release toxins, vastly problematic toxins. So they're the three reasons why fruit is not required. Um, and as a corollary, corroboree, whatever the word is, to that, there are people that will say, oh, yes, but vitamin C, though. Well, it turns out that if you're not consuming a bunch of carbohydrates, then your requirement for vitamin C is near zero. That's why I didn't die of scurvy six and a half years ago. Got it. Um, yeah. So that's it. Now, the few things that you're mentioning of like, you know, if somebody wants to be able to get to 150, they need mm. to be eating a species appropriate diet. Um, yep. How do we know that it's the carnivore diet that is going to be the diet that will allow people to have the most longevity. And I'm not saying the carnivore diet's bad. I mean, yeah. I eat all type yeah. types of different food personally, but I'm not saying the carnivore diet's bad. But how do we know mm. that this is the diet that will lead people towards that? Primary, and I ask that question because, again, yeah. we know many people who do different types of diets. And yeah. because they're reasonable... Um, they have very high vitality at old sure. age, right? Sure. So yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to understand why. Yeah. And what, I, I, I think I understand the question. And the response is that there are a, a bunch of people with different ideological standpoints on what they believe the best diet for a human being is. There are people running around saying veganism is the way to go. Okay, they are wrong, unequivocally, but that's for another day. <laughs> there are people running around saying a balanced diet, a mixed macronutrient diet, the standard Western, standard American diet, take out junk food, is the best diet. Junk food is the problem, is what those people will say. There are people saying all you need to do is avoid seed oils. Seed oils will kill you three weeks before last Tuesday. That's what you need to avoid. Everything else is fine. Eat the carbs if you want. They're not the problem. It's the seed oils. Mm. There are people like me running around saying the carnivore diet looks like it's the way to go. Whichever camp you're in, that statement around what is likely to be the ideal diet for a human being is an opinion, precisely because of what I said earlier, which is that the evidence, the science, the experimental lab-based work is absent. It does not exist and it never will. It's not practical, you can't do it financially, and you can't get ethics to lock people in labs for 40, 50 years. So it's best guess. I believe on the basis of my understanding of science, the scientific process, the way that we garner knowledge, that the best evidence, the evidence of what I deem to be the highest quality, as a very highly qualified, experienced scientist, with a significant publication record of my own and a history of teaching at tertiary educations on four different continents over more than a quarter of a century. Where can people check some I, of that out if they want to look at I some of that? absolutely can. It's a matter of public record. There are, there are all sorts of people claiming that I'm making this shit up, that I never worked in a university, that I don't have three advanced research degrees, that I don't have a publication record. Just go to Google Scholar and enter my name, for goodness sake. It's there. It's public record. It's a fact. So with that history behind me, and that's why I don't bother engaging with those people or, or justifying myself. I have no reason to. My credentials are a fact, whether you like it or not. Whether you like what I'm saying or not, whether you agree with me or not, makes no difference. I have been a professor of health science and a senior lecturer in academia for more than a quarter of a century and I do have a long list of peer-reviewed publications in the literature that anybody can find if they want to go and have a look. What so if, that does qualify me to talk a bit about what I think is good scientific evidence and what is not. And I believe that stable isotope testing, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, et cetera, the studies of the interactions and energetics of our biologic processing system, our metabolic pathways, and to look at the design of our organs and our bodies as a whole are good heart sciences. And those inferences are clear and they are unequivocal. They tell us what seems to be the diet that human beings have unequivocally consumed 
for at least 350,000 years and probably more like four and a half million, actually. Given that we have no question eaten that diet, almost entirely meat and fat and no plants to speak of up until 10,000 years ago, that suggests that that 350,000 to four and a half million years prior to 10,000 ago has informed our genetic structures, our body structures, our organ systems pretty heavily, given that Darwinian evolution, positive and negative selection pressures is a fact. That's what I rely on. Now, if people can see the logic behind that, then good. If they can't, then they're welcome to go and support Greg Douchebag. <laughs> you know, that's fine. That's no skin off my nose. And they're also welcome to come and bomb my channel and unlike bomb all my videos, even the ones they haven't watched, and all of those things that absolutely do help my uh, algorithm and help my channel grow. How that's long have we been? From. How long have we been eating uh, cows for? Cows in the current form, as long as current cows have existed, um, you can argue absolutely that current cows are a human invention because of positive selection pressure on cows by humans, yes. I don't think modern cows are hugely different in terms of the meat or the, the fatty acid profiles or the proteins that make up the muscles than more ancient oxen style beasts and oryx and whatever else. Um, there, there is a, a shared lineage also with the, the mastodon, if you like, and the, and the mammoths and, and all of those kind of large ruminant red meat animals. Do you think it matters um, what they eat? Do you think it matters grass fed and stuff like that? I don't really know. I would sooner see someone eat a grass fed, grass finished meat based diet than any diet containing any significant amount of plant material at all, any day of the week and twice on Sundays. Mm. Sure, there is a slight difference in the in the fatty acid profile in those in those fats, but I don't think it's critical, personally. Parapatch family, how's it going? Now, sleep is essential for your recovery and your performance, which is why we partnered with Eight Sleep Mattresses. We call them the Tesla of beds. Changes the temperature based off how you sleep. Andrew, how can they get it? Yeah, head over to 8sleep.com slash powerproject. And at checkout, you guys will automatically save $150 off your entire order. Links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. So Barnum we don't have any evidence one way or the other. That's a guess. That's an educated guess. So, Bart, I'm curious because... Um, Obviously, we have to work with the environment in front of us. And yeah. let's say, in your belief, species-appropriate mm -hmm. diet is a carnivorous diet. And yeah. um, some people eat different types of diets. Some people do enjoy yeah. eating fruit. Some people enjoy eating rice. There are these things, right? So mm -hmm. for the individuals who, let's say, the carnivore diet isn't for them, but they want mm -hmm. to get into better shape. They want to increase their lifespan and health span. Um, yeah but they're not choosing to do a carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. What habits would you suggest this individual have so that they can navigate their environment? Because some people just like to eat a few fucking Doritos here and there, even though sure. they're not good yeah. for you, right? What would yeah, you, sure. how, how would you have them navigate their environment so they can still get healthier so they don't have to become obese, et cetera? Yeah. Okay. I have a video, it's a, like a in five minutes or less type video. I've got, a, I've got several of those on my channel where I try and tackle a topic as succinctly as I can in five minutes or less. It's like a challenge for myself. Mm -hmm. And in that video, I outline four health hacks that I believe in fully and that I myself follow as closely as I possibly can in my lifestyle. Because I, I too am a human being and imperfect. I do like to have a drink of beer now and then or a piece of pizza mm -hmm. occasionally or a potato chip, you know. Um, a single potato chip. <laughs> <laughs> Just one. Just one. one. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you know, no, um, Make sure you track yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh, dear, dear, dear. Okay, so there are four health hacks that I believe in fully on that video. And I'd probably add a fifth one if I had longer than five minutes. Here they are in order of importance. Take or leave any one of them. It's up to you. It's an individual choice. It's your life. It's your funeral. Number one of most importance, the one thing that will affect your health and lifespan more than anything else, more readily and more quickly than anything else, is your diet. And I believe carnivore 100% is the answer. 
I believe plant material should be eliminated from your diet or as, as eliminated as you can achieve. Okay, so that's number one. I, the caveat there is muscle meat, not organs. Mm. Two, there is a range of supplements available that I'm joint ventured with. I am an affiliate marketer. They are a range of supplements that are designed to increase your release of adult stem cells from your bone marrow to your blood, whereupon they do magic. You can find information about that on the link under any one of my videos on my channel. It's a bit.ly forward slash B-A-R-T hyphen K-A-Y. That's a one-stop shop. That's merchandise store, the store for this particular supplement that I'm referring to. Consults, if you want to consult with me, it's all there. So if you want to check that out, that's where you find out more about that. I'm not going to say anything about that now because that's not what we're here to do. But that's number two in importance. Adult stem cell circulation, vastly important for renewal and repair of your tissues and the reversing of aging process. I know you're not going to get too deep into that, but personally, yep. I've never really heard of those supplements. Is that something newer? Is that something that... Um, the company has been around in various iterations with various different owners and with different names, mm. but the same product basically, although it's been improved for the best part of 30 years. It's, it, I don't know why, but it does seem to be quite a... Uh, quite a well-guarded secret, although it shouldn't be. Everybody in the world, I believe, should should be able to take advantage of this because it's fantastic. Oh, you can go ahead and There's mention another it. video on my channel where I talk about what I believe the thing did for me. I'm not allowed to make a therapeutic claim. I'm not allowed to say cause and effect. The FDA won't allow that. But uh, what I can say is I was suffering from a given medical condition about 12 years ago when I started using this product, 13 years ago now, and that so-called irreversible medical condition that should have left me blind legally by now didn't happen. In fact, my eyesight's better than it was 13 years ago. Wow. Interesting. Um, check it out for yourselves. So that's number two. Number three sounds like crystal waving hippie woo-woo stuff. It sounds nuts. And I don't mind if you think it sounds nuts because I thought it sounded nuts too, but it's not. There is actual science here. And that is you should be grounded electrically to the earth for as much of the time as is possible and feasible in your lifestyle. A physical earth connection. So in effect, how do I do that? I sleep grounded. My bed is grounded. I have a grounding bed sheet. On my desk in front of me right now, I have my hand on a mouse pad that is electrically grounded. If I'm going to sit and watch television in the front room, there's a wrist strap, ankle strap in there that I can put on. So anytime I'm at home, which is most of the time, I can be grounded. It's a good thing. It's There are all sorts of things associated with grounding that are vastly useful to your health and lifespan. For example, I'll just give you one. The second you ground yourself electrically, the effective viscosity, the thickness of your blood drops by a factor of three. Now, when you think about hypertension, stress on the heart tissue, all of that, if you thin your blood down by two thirds, basically, the stress on your heart drops immediately. I'll give you a second one just for fun. Your alpha to delta brainwave activity ratio changes immediately in favor of rest and relax away from fight and flight. Hmm. Okay, I'll give you a third one. Wound healing increases in rapidity. Say that one more time. Day. Hmm? That, that wound last one. healing wound speeds healing. up. Yeah. If you're if you ground X number of hours a day, if you have an injury, it heals more rapidly. Which they've tested on mice. I understand it's not a human test, but you can't again for doing research on humans, you can't go around cutting people to see how quick mm -hmm. they're going to heal. Okay, fine. Quick quick question. So that's Be, number three. Before you get to number oh. four, before you get yep. to number four, um yep. with the grounding thing. Mm -hmm. what what I think about in terms of like maybe a simpler thing is a little bit like walking and getting some sun. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, because getting some sun can help with wound healing. Walking yep. can be beneficial yep. in terms of blood circulation. I don't know yep. if it decreases blood thickness, but my knee-jerk assumption would be motion and walking would, especially if someone were sedentary. Yeah. So Not two-thirds. Not two-thirds, to but to some yeah. degree. Okay. Okay. I mean, the way that one works on the two-thirds is that you absorb electrons out of the earth into your body. 
those electrons are attracted to the membranes of your red blood cells mm -hmm. so that they are coated in negative ions, basically, electrons, and then the red blood cells repel each other, thus allowing, because blood is a non-Newtonian fluid. There's not a lot of good science in this area, is there? Not a lot of good stuff, but there is some short-term okay. case control studies and, and experimental studies that support all this. That's another in five minutes or less video on my channel, Electrical Grounding specifically. You can look at that one too, if you like. It's really interesting. I've heard people mention that. Um, different studies up in that. I've heard so. people mention that a shower is can be a form of grounding. Do you agree with that? Yes, it can, absolutely, because the water is, is a conductor, mm. basically. And so long as some part of the water that you're showering in is grounded electrically at the other end, then you are, in effect, grounded as well. Um, yeah, you'd have to have more a stream of water, though, than actual droplets that are separated out, because as soon as the droplets are separated out and not connected electrically, that's the end of your electrical connection. Mm. So a stream of water rather than droplets, fine. All right, so that's number three is electrical earthing. Number four is the avoidance of all artificial and blue wavelengths of light after the sun has gone down below the horizon. That is a big deal. So orange lenses at night time, basically, and or those screen um, filters that you can get that turn your screen amber at night time. Um, ideally, you'd change all the light bulbs in your house as well and make them amber colored and you know, blue blocking light bulbs. Uh, my good friend Harry Sopanos does that in his house in, in Tasmania, in Australia. But they're about $30 or $40 a bulb, those mm. things. So I'm not going there, but that's fine. He does that. Good. And if I was going to put in a number five, it would be the right amount of the right sort of exercise in the right volume at the right intensity done in the right way. I was That would be my top five ways of improving your lifespan, your health span, all those aspects, and I would put them in that order of importance. In what ways are you not a fan of, uh, I guess, cardio training? Right. Okay. Cardio training, and I, I should really disclaim that as to what I mean. What I really mean there is zone two, the stuff in the middle range of intensity, the stuff above just plain old walking with your heart rate under 125 probably, and below – if you're 20 years of age, below about 175 or 180. So everything in the middle. So what I'm saying is exercise needs to be down here where it's no challenge at all, and you can do it for hours and hours without any problem, or right up here that's going to cave you in as quickly as possible, high intensity, burst and repeat, um, three RM sets, you know, that kind of stuff. The reason for it is because of the way that muscle cells work, because of the fact that muscle cells are trainable in terms of their chemical makeup and their actual physical morphology, if you train for many, many hours in zone two, then your muscle fibers that were more like type three actually morphologically become more like type two. In other words, your muscle fiber makeup in terms of the morphology and the enzymes in the muscle, the number of mitochondria, everything in those muscle cells changes to subserve your chronic exercise loading. Your body responds to training. As you train, so shall you perform. So if you want the maximum hypertrophy, then training in the middle is a bad idea because that will strip muscle mass off you or tend to strip muscle mass off you. Now, if you're doing no exercise at all, typically, chronically, like I don't train anymore at the moment. I haven't trained seriously. Come on, for, bro. <laughs> I know I should, but this I don't. This is really disappointing. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, I, I know it is, but I'm, I'm also working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Oh, well, you're, 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 come on. One of these guys though. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I personally am I, like of of my of my. I was listening to everything you were saying, and, and now then, now uh, now, now yeah, I'm, I'm gonna problem. circle back and question everything. <laughs> you even lift, bro? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. No. Um, I haven't lifted really. I haven't. Well, I used to be a power lifter some 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Actually, 
I haven't trained seriously for any athletic purpose or body comp purpose for at least 10 years. Mm. Um, that's, you know, I've just got to an age and stage in my life where I'm doing other things. I'm working many, many hours a week. It's not an excuse. That's just what is happening. I should exercise. Absolutely. I'm reminded by my dear partner every day. <laughs> Why don't you exercise? No. You know, um, but I don't. Um, and if, if I start to exercise and I started to exercise now in zone two, I would put muscle mass on because, as I said earlier, I'm 135 pounds dripping wet now. Okay. But if I'm your size, Mark, and I do a bunch of type two training, number one, that reduces my energy and my capacity to do type three training, the high intensity stuff, the stuff I should do. It's going to make you feel more hungry because of the way the energetics of that kind of muscle contraction, it's going to tend to strip muscle mass off you. In other words, work against your hypertrophy training. And it's completely unnecessary for you as an athlete. Now, if you tell me you want to run a marathon, I'm going to tell you something different. You need to train specifically for what you want to achieve. You bet. But if you tell me I want to get muscle hypertrophy, then I'm going to tell you to stay away from zone two. That and also years and years and years and years and years of zone two training that endurance athletes typically undertake generally tends to leave those athletes later in life with cardiac problems. Quick question about those types yeah. of athletes. Those athletes are individuals who take that training to that level, correct? It's yeah. not just some yeah. some guy that's just running zone two for fun. It's a person that oh, is- look, you know. <laughs> Half an hour to an hour of zone two training twice or three times a week is not going to be a real problem for you. I'm talking about the blokes that will train. Sorry, I shouldn't just say blokes. It's very sexist. People that will train in zone two for hours and hours and hours and hours a week, mm -hmm. they generally don't make old bones. Okay. So actually, this, this is interesting because... For example, I've been doing jujitsu for seven years. I've tracked mm -hmm. my heart rate. That is a zone two type exercise, as far as my heart rate's concerned. I do a bit okay. of running. Mark has been doing running for quite a while. Um, mm -hmm. Still lift. Uh, yeah. My goal is slowly gaining muscle over time, maintaining muscle. Um, mm -hmm. And for doing jujitsu for this long, there hasn't been, like there's been fat loss, but I've been the yeah. same weight for multiple years. I also know yeah. quite a few people who, again, this isn't someone like we know our, our friend of ours, Zach Bitter. He is a ultra marathon yeah. runner, right? Yeah, I know Zach. He's yeah. exactly so he's on he's on the other side where he's extreme performance for that. Yeah. But an yeah. individual who you know, like Mark and myself, we want to be able to run a few miles without feeling stressed out, yeah. right, or yeah. or having the body respond. Oh. That hasn't yeah. been anything that has really negatively, negatively, mm -hmm. negatively impact hypertrophy. So okay. when you mentioned that- How long would you spar for in a session? Sparring is usually 10 to 15, six minute rounds. And then- Okay, so that's burst and repeat. Even if it might be in the zone two heart rate, that's not rhythmic, steady contractions without rest in between. Fair. The heart's not going on for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. So, but, but that, that's what I'm talking about here. Like the people in our audience that are taking up running or doing something like jujitsu, yeah. right? It's not that my heart rate goes from 150 back to 80, back to 150. It's like, it's yes. staying between like 130 and 155 for the duration yeah. of the sparring yeah. session. But no, I'm not sparring for three, four hours. There's, no, I wouldn't I, I think, do that. I mean, because, I should be clear about yeah. the definition of zone two. And I think not, it's not just a heart rate thing that makes something zone two. It's mm -hmm. also the fact that it's rhythmic muscle contraction without rest at a relatively steady rate of output. Steady state. Or steady state Yeah. for usually several hours in a session. So when you say several hours, you're talking about like what, three, four or two? Like what? what? I'm talking probably upwards of five a week of, of which at least one of those sessions would probably be a two hour session or more for it to be a problem. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of zone two you should avoid. Mm -hmm. So if you were yeah. saying my jujitsu is zone two purely based on heart rate, fine, absolutely. If you like, I'm not telling you to avoid that. So because that's probably yeah. good for you. So yeah, this is this is what I wonder though, because we know so many people who are doing, not like doing two hours of cardio or three hours of running every single day, but that are running consistently 
and that mm. have great amounts of muscle tissue aren't dropping and, and aren't going away, but it's not like they're training like Zach, right? They're, they're, they're in the middle of that. And that's not really negatively impacting their ability to gain muscle mm. because they are adapted to that stress. Like for, I want, I want to give a quick example. When I started mm. running recently, again, I used to be a soccer player for like 16 years, stopped doing that. When I came back yeah. to running, Dude, I could not run a one mile without stopping a few times. That was a few months yeah. ago. Now mm. we can all run like maybe two, three miles fairly easily. Mark's been doing 12 or 13 mile yeah. runs, but our bodies have adapted to that stress and yes. that stress hasn't taken away from our ability to do things in the gym. And we know people right. like that. So it, it's not that we're taking it to the level of being marathon runners, but that zone two training isn't with the way we do it isn't detracting from our hypertrophy ability. So it At makes me, time. so, so what you're saying is it's going to impact us later down the road. It's a, again, it's a bit, how long is a piece of string? It's a bit individual and there is an individual tolerance to cumulative type two training load over a lifetime. If you trained five hours a week in zone two mm -hmm. for 50 years, you might be running into a problem. Why? So you can do a lot of it. That's, that's, you can that's do a lot. quite yes. a bit. The, look, the human body is able to cope yeah. with amazing stress that you wouldn't think it should. Mm. We, can, we can live 95 years eating That's crap. a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. Yeah. And what that does cumulatively is it basically destroys your cardiac function and it destroys your metabolic function. Although the training response immediately to the exercise is an improvement, so-called, in your metabolic function. But actually long-term... It tears you down. Would you agree that cardiovascular training, zone two, steady state cardio might be a good idea for people to do some of that activity? Or do you kind yeah, of I urge for people to stay away from it altogether? Three times a week. Half an hour, twice, three times a week. Got it. At, if you're 30 years of age, you want to go at something like 65 to 75% mm. of 220 minus your age, give or take. Something like that. Andrew, you got anything else over there? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned earlier about uh, eating to satiety mm. might be mm. a better, or sorry, in your opinion, uh, you said it was a, a good approach. I'm sorry. I don't want to twist the words up. Um, sure. First off, how like what does that even mean? And then second, can somebody follow this style of diet without being on a carnivore diet? Right. Okay. What the context of that statement, Andrew, is... In the absence of the intake of fiber and carbohydrate, so in other words, if you are eating meat and fat, meat and animal fat, that is, the, the satiety signaling that your body will give you when it's had enough nutrition, they are powerful for the vast majority of people. <laughs> it is near impossible to overeat on meat and fat. And I can promise you I know about this because I did two weeks of it, remember? Mm -hmm. It was a chore. It was unpleasant. I had to force myself to do it. Okay? It is hard work. It's tough. So what I'm saying is if you eat muscle meat and associated fat, selected dairy products, so long as you don't react ne negatively to that and your body composition is about where you want it to be, give or take, then... As soon as you get that message where you think, geez, I'm pretty full now, that's when you put the fork down. Even if there are two mouthfuls left on the plate, you don't go, oh, well, I'll just eat these. You don't. You stop. You listen to your satiety signaling. You put that in the fridge and you come back to it later or the next day, something like that, whatever. That signaling is good. You will not overeat on that diet unless you are – really, really one end of the bell-shaped curve and your particular satiety signaling absolutely is dysfunctional in some way. And you'll still struggle because it's hard, hard work to eat that much protein and fat. It will be uncomfortable. You'll get the meat sweats. You'll feel <laughs> sick. You'll get the shits probably. You just can't do it. So then can somebody follow that while not being on a carnivore diet? Well, no, because if you're not on a carnivore diet, then you are by definition probably consuming a significant amount of carbohydrate and or fibrous material that will blunt, turn down and destroy that satiety signaling. 
it will cause your blood sugar to tend to drop lower postprandially than it was before you even ate, which will lead you in a several hours later to feel hungry again, to repeat that challenge and pull your blood sugar down still lower again. And so what you'll get is peaks of very, very high blood sugar after eating completely inappropriate carbohydrates, followed by troughs of very, very low blood sugar, leading you to want to repeat the dose. And it's that peaking and troughing of blood glucose that will destroy your body very, very quickly. I'm not on a carnivore diet enough. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you, but you're also very, very active. You exercise a lot. You lift. You're running. You're doing jujitsu. You have yeah, yeah, I know, muscle yeah. mass. You're a big bloke. <laughs> you're not a bloke. <laughs> I'm joking. Your capacity to cut. You know how I said a person's capacity to tolerate carbohydrate in the diet is individual. Yes, yes. And it's based on things like age, stage, physical fitness, body size, time of year. You're an example. You're a big bloke. You've got a lot of muscles. You're very active. Your leeway is much wider than mine. I got you. I'm generally I can't low eat the carbs that you eat. Yeah, and get away with it. There are some days we've mentioned. There's some days I don't have any carbohydrates. Some days where I'm lower mm. carbohydrates. Some days where I have higher carbohydrates. Um, my diet personally ranges quite a bit. I haven't tracked in years, but mm -hmm. um, cool. it, it's. It, I was just. I was joking around. There's probably but also, uh, I mean, if, if you get up in the morning and you stand in front of a full length mirror without your kit on, and you have a look and everything looks fine, you're tracking. Oh, you don't have to count your oh, calories yeah, yeah, or yeah. your macros or any of that. Mm -hmm. You are keeping an eye on your physiology. Absolutely. Yeah. So you are tracking. Yes. You're just yeah. Doing okay. it in a way that works. Yes, because I am. Because you now understand the mechanisms. You've found a methodology that works for you individually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got enough experience with it that you know when it's going awry. Yeah. I would say it's probably fair to say that we probably eat 70 to 80% meat. Most of the time. Right? Yeah. If not, like, some days it's 100%. But yeah, Don't most of the time. Don't you care about the environment? What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, fuck <laughs> it. Let it burn. destroy it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there was a song about it. The roof, the roof, the roof. <laughs> Bart, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about this. Um, so... With with an example of Lane Norton, where do you think he and his messaging is going wrong? Because he's actually an individual that I think he's great at having a nuanced approach and messaging when it does come to calories in, calories out. He's a big fan of fiber, big fan of a varied diet. Um, mm -hmm. He he seems, I mean, we've talked to him many times, his approach does seem very reasonable and it does follow through with that calories in, calories out paradigm. Is there yeah. something wrong? Or if there is something wrong with what he's putting forward, where is it? Okay. Lane is the holder of a PhD in nutritional science. Mm -hmm. And he has, I think, something like maybe a dozen or slightly more peer-reviewed publications to his name. I think he worked in academia for less than 10 years, and now he's self-employed. Good, you know, good luck to him. That's fine. Um, as am I these days fine. His apparent credentials stack up, but it's not until he opens his mouth that you find huge holes in his understanding or his messaging or whatever. And sure, I might be straw manning him a bit for, for clicks and for views. Why not? You know, it's not like I've never been straw manned myself. But when Lane Norton says things like the first law of thermodynamics states that mass is conserved, Straight away, there's an absolute opportunity for me to jump all over the boy. Because number one, the first law of thermodynamics says nothing remotely similar to that. And secondly, the reason it doesn't say that is because mass is not conserved. <laughs> it is not conserved. He's wrong on that completely. Um, in, in a context of in everyday life, he might be right. Because when the human body processes carbohydrates, fats, amino acids, and alcohol, that mass does not disappear. So he's right in that way, but he's not, again, he's not giving us the full information and he's presenting it in a way that gives me an opportunity to go, <laughs> look, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and so obviously I jump all over that because that's what we do here in terms of this kind of let's, Let's have some niggle between us. Let's let's start some shit. Let's you know. He said niggle. Go for mm -hmm. He said niggle. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, so mm -hmm. yes, I'll do that. 
I believe that the contention that calories in, calories out is a predictable, valid, robust, and useful tool for Joe Public to use in order to make changes to their body composition through dietary intervention. I believe that to be a badly flawed argument. I believe that to be false. I believe that on average, that will not work precisely because it's only half a story and you need absolutely to understand the very, very vital role of the endocrine system, the hormonal system, inflammatory systems, et cetera, in what a person's eventual body composition is. And there are many examples of times when calories in, calories out, standalone as a statement, because that's what it is. Calories in, calories out implies that there is nothing else to worry about. Eat less, move more. That's what calories in, calories out says. And unless you clearly state that that is not correct and there is nuance and you need to do several things correctly, then you're not giving the full story. Now, I believe Lane makes an attempt to give us more nuance. I, I genuinely, I'll give him that. But he then says things like fiber is indicated. No, it isn't. He will say a balanced diet is a good thing. If it fits your macros, he'll say. No, lame, mistake, wrong, false. He will say things like you should avoid saturated fat because of the cholesterol issue. No, wrong again, false. So, yes, he's got credentials. Yes, he can present himself as credible when he wants to. But half of what he says is demonstrably incorrect. And as such, given the way I've chosen to present myself on YouTube, the way I've chosen to be combative, abrupt, abusive, rude, obviously I'm going to jump on those things and point to those things immediately. I'm not here to make mates with Lane Norton. Um, I'm here to, to, to suggest to Lane that if he actually had any testicular fortitude whatsoever, he would face me man to man and have a discussion with me online, live on camera, wherein we can work out who it is that knows their stuff here out of the two of us. And he's refused on several occasions to do so. Instead of dealing with the arguments that I make, which are actually unassailable, that's why he won't engage, Instead, he tries to undercut me by claiming things like, for example, I never did work in academia. He claims that the university I claim to lecture at or to be a professor at doesn't have a record of me, etc. These are all lies. Purely to avoid and to save face instead of actually fronting up for the discussion on the topic matter. We can even do it politely. I don't even need to swear at him. I do that for my stick on my channel, but if you'd rather have a discussion with me sensibly and academically, I'll tear the boy to bits. There's no two ways about it. People just assume that I'm, I'm not capable of doing that with a real genuine academic purely because I behave a buffoon on my channel. So they think, therefore, that must be the only tool I've got. It's a sucker punch. Why so, do you there you go. <clears throat> Why do you think uh, we applied the law of ther thermodynamics to uh, human diet? And is that what it was originally for? And like, and how long have we been doing this for? Right. Okay. The first law of thermodynamics is a case limited example of the practical application or upshot of the law of conservation of energy, as outlined first, probably by. Emily Nurther more than anybody else, I would suggest. It was designed and formulated by folks who were wanting to understand the relationship between heat energy and the capacity to encapsulate that heat energy in a closed system and use the force of that heat energy to translate that energy into physical movement, kinetic movement, of a piston in a closed system in order to drive a train down a steam train line. That's what thermodynamics was about. Thermo, heat, dynamics, movement. So originally it had nothing to do with a human being. Nothing whatsoever. And the first law of thermodynamics being a case limited example, by definition, 
absolutely demands that its dictates, which are mathematical and not words, by the way. So when you often I say to people, they say, oh, the first law of thermodynamics, blah, blah, blah. And I say, great, tell me what that is. Quote it for me. You know more about this than I do. You're the expert. I'm just an idiot here, clearly. You tell me, what is the first law of thermodynamics? I don't want to put you on the spot, guys, but oh, yeah. I'm betting my bottom dollar, you guys couldn't do it. If I said to you, what is the first law of thermodynamics? Quote it. Because almost nobody does know. Oh. Almost nobody knows. I'll just take a guess. It's, it's I don't know, have any up. idea. But yeah, go, go matter can neither be created nor destroyed. I don't know. That's what I was going to say. Right. Like, right. Say that again. Sorry, Mark. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Right. You got that directly from Lane Norton, didn't you? I don't know where I saw it, but yeah. <laughs> nah, that's, that's just something you hear. Yeah, that's, that's something you hear. you hear a lot. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I was going to say the same is, thing. But, that is yeah. a statement of a so-called law of conservation called the conservation of matter, which is false. Matter is not conserved. In physics, that is a falsehood. Anyone that knows physics understands that. The thing that is conserved, the quantity that is conserved regarding matter in some way is actually energy. Matter is a form of energy, a condensed form of energy, actually. But that's for another day. That's not the important point here. The important point is that the law, the first law of thermodynamics is a case-limited mathematical statement regarding certain aspects of the law of conservation of energy in a set context. That context being a closed thermodynamic system. By definition, that is the requirement. Absolutely. Because the first law of thermodynamics says delta U is equal to Q minus W. That's all it says. Nothing else. There are no implications. It doesn't invoke any law of anything. It makes a clear statement. And it says the internal energy of a closed thermodynamic system the change in internal energy in that system is equal to the specific heat capacity of that system minus any work done by that system. In other words, put heat into a system and you can cause that system to do work. Do work in a system and you will produce heat in that system. That's the interaction. The statement of the first law of thermodynamics makes no statement whatsoever about mass precisely because it is case limited to a closed thermodynamic system that is incapable of allowing mass to cross its border. Example, a closed bomb calorimeter. Human beings are not a closed bomb calorimeter. We can exchange mass across our system boundaries. I'll give you an example of that. <sighs> I've just breathed out a bunch of mass. How much calories was in that mass that I just breathed out? No idea. First law of thermodynamics does not apply to an open thermodynamic system. We're done. People that don't understand that should stop saying the first law of thermodynamics says because they don't know what it says. And Lane Norton does not know what it says because he thinks it says mass is conserved. It says nothing remotely similar to that. One of us is an actual scientist with an actual history of doing a significant amount of science and the other one is Lane Norton. Real, real quick question. Yeah. Yes. When I pay attention to a lot of a lot of these things, the thing that I guess the thing that I care about is when applied to the individual, is this going to be something that is going to help them get to their goals or is it is it not? Right? And okay. there there's right. That is so general, but at the end of the day, I think of like in practice, will this work and will this help? I get yep. the law of thermodynamics thing. It's 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 Apparently it's incorrect, right? Yep. But I mean, and it's incorrect and it's also communicated by a lot of other people. Okay. So yep. it, it's wrong. Yep. But I immediately be, I just immediately think, why, why does this matter? Like, why is, why is this important? So what? Be, 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 but it, yeah. it matters because it's wrong. I'm, I'm not saying it, it's, yeah. it's not, yeah. it doesn't matter. But I mean, in the larger context of helping somebody get from point A to point B, you know, yeah. that's where I'm just like, okay, I get it, but okay. why? Right. Let me kind of encapsulate that in the best way that I can. At the end of the day, there are all sorts of people in the world that will offer you advice on all sorts of topics. Mm -hmm. It is up to you. It is your responsibility with the best of your ability and your 
intelligence and, and the things that you've got going for you and your ability to research things for yourself or whatever, it is up for you to decide who you want to listen to, who makes sense and who doesn't make sense. Will a straight out statement, calories in, calories out, eat less and move more, will that assist people, some people, any people in losing weight? That sure, will not work some for people most will succeed doing that. Yeah. Sure. Is it predictable? Is it definite? Will it absolutely work without question? No, there is a question that it might not for you. A, because you'll be unable to accurately track your calories in. B, because you'll be unable to accurately track your calories out. And C, because you don't understand the interaction between energy in and energy out as that relates to your endocrine system, your hormonal system, and your inflammatory system. D, you might believe charlatans like Lane Norton who say mass is conserved and the first law of thermodynamics says so. You, you're going down the wrong path. You may not only not succeed in your goal, but it's likely that if you follow that advice to the point where it does actually start to work for you, most people that do that will have to undereat to a degree that is unhealthy long-term and will crush their metabolism, destroy their prospects of long-term health, be very damaging to them psychologically, probably while we're at it. It is not good advice. That's why it's important. I do, now, that's, yeah. that's my professional opinion based on more than a quarter of a century in academia, mm -hmm. teaching this material to postgraduate students, researching this myself independently as a research scientist, and undertaking multiple multi-million dollar consultancies externally with major organizations with huge budgets and a lot to lose. I like some of what you're saying because I don't want to get into the LDL thing because it's too going to mm -hmm. be too long. Uh, we can sure. have you on another time and discuss that. Absolutely. But it kind of reminds me of people talking about cholesterol and then mentioning uh, these statins that could potentially help. And the yep. uh, root thing that we're trying to uh, stop in that case is like heart disease. But we might be just looking at the wrong thing because we might have the wrong information at the root of the very mm. beginning of how this meme got propagated out outward. And, and I personally been a person that has not been a huge fan of calories. I have been saying for a long time that I feel that they're very inaccurate, um, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the protein side of things. And I've always found it really interesting when we do have guests on the show and we start to ask them, we're like, calories, calorie. And they're like, yeah, well, kind of except for protein. And then they're like, well, kind of except for a fiber and kind of, ex <laughs> you know, so kind of except for the not. it's a lot of, it's a lot of nuance, yeah. but yeah. I think what people can carry with them from this show is if you increase the amount of meat that you eat, you're going to help drive down hunger signals, which, could, which can help you over time control your appetite. We know that we know that by figuring out a way to manage the overall amount of food that you eat in a day, and when you make better quality food choices over a long period of time, mm. it's going to be hard to continue to gain weight. And for many individuals, it most likely will help them to lose weight, especially if they bring in a little bit of exercise. I think yeah. that's kind of the overarching theme here, right? Yeah. Look, if, if I was to close off with just two things that I believe people should do, all people should do, if you want to have close to ideal body composition, and I'm not talking about hypertrophy training, musculature, I'm talking about your fat carriage here. Okay. Here's what you should do. Stop eating plants and plant material and fiber and, carb and carbohydrates and stop consuming any seed oils at all. Do those two things, eat to satiety on muscle meat and fat of animals. Why can't you just be nice? Why, why can't you just be nice and just say that? And not, um, not be so mean to everybody. <laughs> well, because I'll tell you why. I, I'll give you this mark. Like people often say to me, why the hell do you behave the way you do on the internet? What what the hell is your problem? They say to me. And I say, actually, I don't have a problem. Except this. I actually have another YouTube channel where it's all collar and tie, no swearing, no cursing. It's just, here's the science, boys and girls. Nobody fucking watches it. Damn it. They're not Damn interested. <laughs> People want to be shocked, hooked, amused, offended. They, they, they tune in because they want to see what's this guy going to say now. He's got a point. 
what's this crazy bull mofo from New Zealand going to say next? That's why I do it. Because at this stage, I have a relatively small following of around about 30,000, give or take, who are quite fanatical followers, love what I do, think it's amusing as hell, enjoy the fact that I'm educating by subterfuge before people realise I've done it. Because anyone that actually sits through this entire podcast, Mark, and listens to every word I've had to say in this, not one of those people will be able to come back to you and say, that guy was an imbecile. He was an idiot. He didn't know what he was talking about. Because I fucking do. That's how I get it in. By, by shocking you that I actually do know what I'm talking about because you expect that I'm probably not going to based on what you think I've said because someone like Greg Doucette takes some of my videos and cuts sections out of them out of context and paints me out to be the larrikin. He's done me a favor. All right. I have a question for you, though. I have a question for you because <laughs> this this kind of started with, right, calories in, calories out without nuance is going to lead mm. most people to fail. Yep. Now, I know Lane is the, the thermodynamics thing. Okay, but that's wrong. Um, yep. Greg screams Seiko from the mountaintops. Yep. yep, and he's wrong. But, but... Even though this is the paradigm of their messaging, those yeah. two, Greg has a cookbook where there's a lot of nuance. I know you don't agree with the vegetables and the fruit, whatever, but there is nuance yeah. to allow people to eat to satiation. Lane yeah. has books, he's put things forward where there is a lot of nuance when it comes to this messaging. It's not sure. just Seco, eat more, move less, right? So right. with that being said, aren't you taking one thing and going at it versus the nuance of the messaging they have as far as nutrition okay. is concerned. Is it, what you're asking me is, is this a straw man argument by me? And to some degree it is. Okay. Four clicks, four views, for the advertising revenue that comes along with it, for notoriety, for the ability to push my channel out there. Yes. But it's only partly a straw man because it is still very, very important that people understand that based on my very, very significant background, understanding, knowledge, experience, scientific, whatever, it is my absolutely firm and unshakable belief that the optimal diet is a carnivore diet 100%. And anyone suggesting that any significant amount of plant material of any kind in the diet is good for you is in error, and they are not doing people a favor by saying that. It will do damage. It will shorten health span. It will shorten lifespan, I believe. Okay. And so I am vehemently opposed to people suggesting that the intake of a balanced diet of any kind, carbohydrates of any kind, fiber of any kind, anyone saying that's a good idea, in my mind, is absolutely unequivocally in error. And they are, they are doing harm. And why? most of those people don't have the credentials to back up what they're saying. Why have so many people uh, had uh, some real blowouts during World Carnivore Month? What's some of your speculation on uh, people just having to camp out on the toilet when they primarily move over to just eating oh, meat? Oh, yeah, okay, I see what you mean. Yep. Liquefied. <laughs> I, I, make it, I make it very, very clear at all times, whenever I'm talking about this to people on, on my channel, on all my videos, I, I don't know how many times I've said this. Please don't change your diet markedly from anything to anything else overnight. Yeah. Do not do that. <laughs> that will mess up your microbiome. That will cause you to get the shits or constipated or you know any number of other problems that can occur. You must change your diet slowly and steadily over a number of weeks. Mm. Yes, a carnivore diet is ideal, but not tomorrow if you're not there today. <laughs> In about six weeks from now, do it steadily, ramp-wise, slowly. Otherwise, you will end up with the shits, almost <laughs> certainly, if not worse. <laughs> Where can people find it? Where can they find out more information about you? Okay, so my main YouTube channel is that one there. It's the Bart K Health Science Channel. That's the one where I'm cursing and swearing at people like Greg <laughs> and Lane Norton. That's the one where I'm as abrasive and uh, confrontational as possible. 
Uh, that's the one where you'll sometimes see me pretending to be some kind of military officer. That's actually more to do with that channel, the Meet Militia, hence that character. He's called the Field Marshal, and he's got a little mate called Lord Edward Yellow, Yellow Ted, who was also very sweary in his own right. That is a uh, horror man. movie bear, bro. That <laughs> yeah. shit is scary. Oh, man, You're mad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's the Health Science Channel. There's the Meat Militia Channel. I've got a third channel, which is the professorial collar and tie, no swearing, no cursing. Here's just the science channel. Um, that's called the Institute for Health Science Integrity. I've got several other little YouTube channels. As well. I, I'm actually a, a failed musician as well, so I actually play guitar and sing. Mm. So I've got that on there as well. There's okay. another channel all about how beautiful New Zealand nature is. It'll blow your socks off if you're interested in that. If you want to consult with me on any aspect of anything, you can do that at the bit.ly forward slash Bart hyphen K-A-Y address, all of which, all of these things you'll find linked in the show notes under all my videos on my channel. Um, I've got a presence on Instagram, which I look at once a week if you're lucky. Um, my email address, if you want to email me and tell me exactly what sort of a see you next Tuesday I am, then you can, absolutely. Um, you'll find that email address on the About tab on the front page of my fine, fine, actually science-based YouTube channels. Um, or if you punch my name into the search engine of your choice, the first 10 pages of results will be videos that I've made and posted or people commenting on videos that I've made and posted saying how much they agree with me because no one's ever said anything negative about me online so far. It's been really lucky in that respect. Tee hee. Um, I also post videos on the Odyssey platform as well, which is a more, what's touted as a more free speech platform, less censorious, shall we say, than the YouTubes. That's quite important for someone who behaves like I do online. So all my old videos that used to be on YouTube that are not on YouTube anymore are over there on Odyssey if you want to see those. That's the main places you'll find me. Enjoy. Binge watch. Have a laugh. And you'll learn something by subterfuge before you realize you've learned something. Hey, get your ass in the gym, would you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I will. I really will. <laughs> um, it's, it's one of those things on the never never. It's always, you know, <laughs> this year I'm getting back to, I'm going to lift 2023. <laughs> All right, Bart. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. All right. See you, boys. See ya. It was pleasant. <laughs> it's it was good. good. It's great to have people on that you uh, don't agree with. Like it. It makes for. Um, it makes for uh, easy, easy. Uh, I guess like um, conversation, easy topic. You know. Mm -hmm. You know. Oh, so overarching things. One big thing that I think that we all agree with is long term for most people, tracking calories is not probably the ideal solution. You know, within like, remember Hopper Rika and Amada Kahatsu came onto the mm -hmm. show? She's in amazing shape. She talked about the way she eats, very regimented, tracks everything. And she said, This is sustainable for me. That isn't sustainable for most people. Chris Bumstead said, like, I think three weeks out, he cuts his calories for like 1,200 and rides that out and goes and competes Ooh. and gets in crazy shape, right? right? I mean, that, but he doesn't you know, sustain that forever. No. If he did, mm -hmm. just for a period of time, he'd be fucked, like, like yeah. Bart oh, did yeah. mention, yeah. right? So I, you know, he, he's very careful with those words and he's make sure that people are careful with the words yeah. that they use. And I, I do appreciate that um, because he does have a point that number one, tracking calories is inaccurate. When people do it correctly, it's within an average. So that's why they can get those results. But most people, that is a big impact on your lifestyle. Mm. That's, a, that's a lot of attention paid to this thing. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of attention that's paid to what you're doing. Whereas if you change your habits and you choose a diet that allows you to eat to satiation, it can be easier, much easier actually, and could probably work for most people it's always easy to kind of point out what you feel is easy when you do it and you have success with it yeah. and then you want to share it out with other people and you're like this is this is what works for me and because it worked for me and it worked for andrew i know mm -hmm. it's going to work for you and you get all excited and uh trying to pick out what's easy is is not it's not an easy thing to do because each person's lifestyle is so different yep 
And when we think about it, our success rate with diet is like really, really poor. Like we, we do not do very well with it. Um, his solution, however, uh, <laughs> would his solution work for people to switch to a carnivorous style diet? Yeah, it would work mm -hmm. if they could do it, but to have any adherence to that. So I think a lot of times what we're trying to do on this show is we hear somebody talking about like eating pizza or ice cream. Oh, I'm obsessed with this. I'm obsessed with that. Uh, like I, what I mentioned to David Weck, like he talks about how much ice cream he eats <laughs> and I tried to give him a suggestion and he's like, it didn't work, <laughs> but, but he also, <laughs> but he also didn't try it. <laughs> right. Yeah. My suggestion to him was he likes to eat ice cream every night. And I said, well, just buy like one, every time you go to the store, just buy like one thing of ice cream mm -hmm. and then just don't go to the store for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. But he just didn't think that that would be something he can follow because he's kind of all or nothing. And I didn't realize that. So I would have to curtail the diet towards somebody who has that uh, mentality. I mean, a carnivorous diet, I don't think that anyone would disagree that if you got rid of plant materials, which we got to keep in mind are in processed foods, and you got rid of seed oils, again, processed foods, if you got rid of all processed foods and primarily ate meat, um, I just... I can't even uh, I can't even think of someone that wouldn't have success if they were able to actually do that. They did it, and that so that is the thing where like, and Bart it will did, work. It but will. Will work. you be able to make it work for you? And that's the thing. I think Bart did say this. He mentioned that calories out, calories calories in, calories out does work. It works with people who are actually able to apply it. The thing is. That is not most of the population. That's his, that seems to be the main gripe here. I would agree that most, there's something fishy with it too, where it's like you try it and you're like, I didn't really move yet. And then you go lower, lower, lower. I think mm -hmm. that does happen to some people in some it cases. It happens to some people, but the thing is you're not supposed to do that. Right. You see that that's personal choice. User the, error. That is user error mm -hmm. in, in action. So, I agree. you know, if, if you're, if you're tracking your calories, right. And I'm not, I'm not saying you need to, well, the, okay, I tracked my calories for years back in the day, especially when I did a lot of shows. It did help me understand what's in food. That's why, like nowadays, I navigate things without tracking as far as putting the food on the scale. Even right now, I'm, I'm, I'm being very careful what I'm saying. I'm tracking without putting my food on the scale, but I kind of have this thing in the back of my head, this calculator that yeah, goes on. To be honest, we're always tracking. To be, we are always tracking because yeah, we are always tracking. You but, see yourself in a video on Instagram. You don't look the same as you did three weeks ago. You're gonna yeah, right, you're down gonna down yeah, you're gonna make some changes. But we know how to make those changes intuitively. We know how to make those changes on the fly. But the thing is, is like with people, the reason why like it works is because there are people that are doing it with great success. So the big thing is. How can we add as much nuance into that topic? So if people do choose the route of tracking, they can have the highest success rate possible. Give them tools that allow them to eat to satiation. Give them tools that allow them to have daily habits that will lead them in that direction, right? There's so many things that can make this higher statistically relevant. Same thing with carnivore. You know, give them some nuance. Maybe try some red meat because it's more nutrient dense. Maybe do this, this, because then maybe they'll enjoy the diet and they'll be able to stick to it. It's it's kind of the same thing with this nutritional messaging. I'm not a PhD in nutrition, but we try to give as much nuance as possible so you can have the most success. We know there's a lot of great information out and around on all kinds of things to solve your problems and people will have an issue and you'll just think, wow, I, I'm aware of five or six books that are on that exact topic that this person is mentioning to me. Mm -hmm. And of course, yeah, it would be helpful for you to go and read those three or four books. But like, I'm a person that doesn't read. <laughs> I choose not to read. So, you know, to, to force a, a carnivore diet on somebody might be, might be a similar thing. Like they don't want to do it. Um, they don't, they don't want to, they don't want any part of it. Maybe they don't really love meat that much. Um, maybe it, maybe it's scary to them. I think that's, a big factor for a lot of people, things are scary and things are uh, perceived as like painful almost like that. Mm. And pe people think it's going to take away their fun. They think it's going to change their life in a real negative way. Yeah. And it could be right. There's going to be a lot of changes when you change your diet and you get rid of alcohol and you get rid of a bunch of stuff. Um, it might change who you hang out with. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's done that for us. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. 
We t- the alcohol things again, you know, you can fit alcohol into your diet. We just choose not to drink much. You actually had some wine this weekend, right? I did. I saw that on your story. Mm-hmm. Look at you. <laughs> some red wine. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, th- there are just certain things we don't do. I, I don't choose to drink a lot because I know where that can lead. I know that'll fuck up sleep. You don't want to be up. a fucking loser. Exactly. <laughs> that actually is what it comes down. That truly, honestly, for me, it, I'll be yeah. a fucking loser if I drink a lot. I know that. If you drink a lot, you're not a loser, maybe. <laughs> but for me, no I'll self- be a loser. We have no self-control. Yeah. Mm. So, hey, I, 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 you know, going into this conversation, I think that um, I was prepared to get frustrated because I wasn't sure if there would be things that we could reach some like rational agreement on. But, you know, Bart is smart and he's very careful with the way he puts things forward. And I think in essence, he wants people in this space to be more careful with how they put ideas forward. I would say it's almost helpful that he's not in the fitness space. He kind of is though, right? He's coming he's, out in the more not. in the sciencey researchery mm-hmm. researchy saying. space. And I think that uh, whether it be Lane or Greg or us, like we're all we're all gone. <laughs> <laughs> we're all out to lunch. We all we're all a little crazy. But there is a thing that he that he holds a, a point. Like I think that Greg is doing a great job. Because like he does have nuance. Same thing with Lane. Um, but if anybody is putting forward information on this stuff, you do have to be careful with kind of how you do say things. You need to be careful. Like, I mean, I'm not personally dogmatic as far as nutrition. Like I, he says the carnivore diet is the ideal diet. There are people that are thriving on quite a few different diets. Um, but you should try to include as much as possible. And in today's way that a lot of content is put forward, especially like TikTok, Instagram, mm-hmm. where it's shorter firm form, things are put forward with no nuance and it gets clicks and views. So someone who's trying to learn about something mm-hmm. in terms of nutrition, they watch a one minute video. Hopefully they'll do this of more of a service than watching a one minute video. But seeing that, seeing someone say, you can eat all of this in your diet as long as you just track your calories, Right. They go and do that, they're probably going to fail because there's no nuance behind it, right? So that's what we should continue to try to do. We should try to add nuance into the things that we say. Yeah, and it's tough because I think that uh, people trail off, you know, like, uh, you know, you, you get, like people will, whether something's clipped or not, yeah. you'll clip it, right? Like mm-hmm. you'll be like, oh, the guy said eat more protein, but you didn't hear like the follow-up that the guy said. Maybe the guy... Maybe the three, four things he said behind the protein thing was actually really important for you to listen to. And you just, you just took that one thing with you. And that's how we, that's kind of how we get successful. Cause we're like, all right, I'm going to take that. I'm going to put that into practice. I'm going to try that. And you, that's kind of how we do things. So it's you get hard. A McDonald's and then you just get four patties instead of one. Mm-hmm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you get a, a, you get a couple Big Macs and a, and a French fry and a chocolate shake. More protein though. Right, right. It's still carnivore, right? Because the milkshake's dairy, and the bun isn't necessarily real. There you go. It's like a yoga mat, exactly. So it's not plants. And if you eat the French fries with the meat, it all is a wash. Well, you know, you can keep those fries on a, you know, on a board, whatever. You could store you them. them. Mm-hmm. They never go bad. So that means you just eat them, and it goes right through your system. You shit it right out. You put them true. on the ground outside and they ground and you get the energy from the earth. <laughs> well, so the, the thing burns about up the calories, the, the <laughs> thing about the fries though, that I especially appreciate is because um, the potato is already cold and then they heat it. Mm. So when it's, it's already, you know, it's warm resistant in the ground, starch. it gets cold out in the air and then it gets reheated. So it turns into a resistant starch. And you know, mm. that, and in, that increases its thermic effect because you eat it warmer. Mm-hmm. So it burns faster. It takes less energy to burn, maybe, or more energy. More energy, so you okay. burn more c- c- heat. C- c- <laughs> energy. This is total bro science, guys. We're fucking with you. No, not. It takes more energy to eat a lot of foods that produce a lot of gas, too. So that might be something you might want to look into. And then also, you have to stand in line at McDonald's. So you're burning yeah. calories. You'll be gassy, but you'll be ripped. <laughs> you'll be ripping them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I would, I would go as far as to say that a majority of ripped people are gassy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't want to be behind anybody that's ripped. I think it comes with the territory. <laughs> yeah. You got to be careful. <laughs> it's because they're eating those plants. Those plants and protein you know, My girl's sometimes. gassy and she's in good shape. I think that is a good indication 
of being in shape. Do you fart or not? Being Often. healthy. Being healthy. I know I uh, <laughs> helped uh, Jessica Smith's dad years ago. I helped him with his diet. <laughs> yeah. And he was so frustrated. He comes back in like a couple weeks later and he's like, he's like, I'm down like 20 pounds or something. It was like in three weeks or something. Yeah, yeah. I was like, that's awesome. He's like, but man, I've never been so disappointed. <laughs> he's like, I haven't farted the entire time. What? <laughs> he's like, this is terrible. He's like, I, I'm known, I'm known for these that's things. my identity. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, damn, that's pretty awesome. Dude. Yeah, my wife was filming my son doing something cute, and then I'm just in the background. I, I didn't know she was filming, and I'm just ripping ass, and she's just like, babe, like I'm recording him, and you're just in the background. All you hear is you farting the whole time. I'm like, oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> dog, do you know if, you know, my, my dogs fart a bit, and oh, I fart a bit. I don't think my house smells like fart, but you know, you also don't smell your own smell, mm. right? And my girl farts a bit too, so like we don't know. Somebody Do walks know? in, they just get fucking clotheslined by the fart smell, and they're just like, "Whoa, just what come happened?" In and come out. It's kind of funny how you like just let loose when you're sleeping. You know, and oh. you don't really know. I like went up. I went to the bathroom the other night, and I come back. And I'm like. Whoa. <laughs> I'm like, I must be just like dropping him over here. Not even knowing. Like, and not even knowing because I'm asleep or whatever. Like, That's God a, damn, it was thick. Andy must love you, bro. Because you <laughs> She's stuck shit. around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dealing with that, man. That's wild. Good for y'all. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's just the money she's in. <laughs> she's a real. Andrew, take us on out of here. <laughs> Let's get out of here before anything <laughs> worse happens. So uh, oh. thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Um, I don't know if the, the dislikes actually will help, but if they... How about you just don't dislike if they it. Just give it a like. If Because a lot of people probably did hit that dislike button, uh, please hook it up with some help and hit that, uh, that like button just to kind of try to... Uh, even out some of the uh, the ratio there mm. and I drop some comments on uh, what you guys thought about today's conversation uh, hit uh, again hit that like button and then subscribe if you guys are not subscribed already uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram TikTok and Twitter my Instagram TikTok and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z uh, links for everything we talked about is in the description but if you guys want a quick shortcut uh, just go to powerproject.live for everything podcast related and Seema where you at check out the Discord below powerproject.live like Andrew said for the devil pussy mug and a bunch of other stuff we're adding on there at Seema Inyang on Instagram and YouTube and Seema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter Mark. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell and where we had a lot of agreement with today's guest is on the matter of protein mm -hmm. so I want to encourage you once again I think I say this all the time I want to encourage you to utilize protein leverage utilize protein as a leverage uh, to help you with your diet so try to jack that protein up I also agreed with what he said don't try anything like randomly overnight. Oh yeah. So if you're yeah. no, if you're not really sure on how much protein you eat, uh, there's no reason for you to to uh, wake up tomorrow and try to strive for 250 grams of protein out of nowhere. Start start out light and easy, so that way you're not shitting yourself all over the place. <laughs> but uh, I, I found it really useful. I think all of us have found it really useful to really jack that protein up mm -hmm. and make the diet kind of surrounded. Um, by by the uh, the protein being the main the main source of your uh, of your food, strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. I'm at Mark's Millie Bell. Catch you guys later. Bye. <laughs>